Good morning, and welcome to worship with Saugatuck Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Westport, Connecticut. I am the Reverend Allison Buttrick Patton, and this is the first Sunday of the month, which means that today we gather around Christ's table for Holy Communion. To do that this morning, I need your help. If you haven't done so already, I invite you to go to your kitchen and to find some bread. That bread might be whatever you have in your refrigerator, bagels, a roll, maybe homemade cornbread. Also find something to drink, juice or wine, even water will do. Jesus used that which was already set out for dinner when he gathered his friends for that first communion service. Put the bread on a plate, get a cup, and set those things somewhere close at hand. This morning, we are joined by a special guest, Sarah Drummond, who is the founding dean of Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School. John Canning, a Saugatuck member and also a member of the Andover Board, will introduce Sarah to us later in the service. For now, I just want to express deep gratitude for her participation and extend a warm Saugatuck welcome. Later this Sunday morning at 12.15 p.m., the Reverend Dr. Drummond will join us live on Zoom to share some updates from Andover Newton Seminary and to be in conversation with all of us. During that time, we will also be introducing to you Yale Divinity School student, Jack Mahoney. I am excited to share the news that Jack will be joining us at Saugatuck Church this fall as our next seminary intern. He's stopping in to say hello this morning, so don't miss it. Join us at 1215 live on Zoom. That's right after our Bring Your Own Coffee social hour, also live on Zoom at 11 a.m. You can find the links for both of those events and for all of the events and ways that we use to gather during the week at SaugatuckChurch.org, on the events section of our Facebook page, on the Saugatuck Church app, or in your email. And if you'd like to be added to our email list, I invite you to drop me a note at Allison, with one L, A-L-I-S-O-N, at SaugatuckChurch.org. If you're watching this on Sunday morning, I look forward to seeing you very soon. Now, friends, I invite you to take a deep and spirit-filled breath. find the ground beneath your feet, and to give thanks for all of those who share this faith journey with you. And hear this, I am so glad that you found your way to this corner of God's beloved community. Here, we celebrate the love of God, which always finds a way. Here, we celebrate the grace of God, which fills up all our aching, empty spaces. So come, whatever your age or the color of your skin, however you move through the world, whomever you love, bring your curiosity, your worry and your wonder, and your very best vision for a world transformed into newness. We need all of that. We need all of you to be Christ's Easter people in the world. Beloved, the risen Christ is at large. Together, let us worship with thanks and with praise. Will you pray with me? Holy One, we lift up our eyes to the hills. From where does our help come? Our help comes from you, creator of heaven and earth. To you who loves and lifts up all creation, we lift our hearts this day. Come, Holy Spirit, come.
Amen. Hi friends! I'm so glad you're here. I have a question. Maybe it's a thought and I hope you can relate because I'll feel better if I'm not the only one who has felt this way before. I really hate it when I ask God for help or ask a question and I don't get the answer that I want. Like when is social isolation ending? Someday is not the answer that I'm looking for. I don't want to do this hard stuff. Seriously, I follow the rules. I say my prayers because I want life to be easy. Like that Staples easy button. Anyway, I only want to walk downhill. I want to order pizza every day. And really, I just want to watch TV, sit on the couch, have some snacks all day. Just tell me what I should do and I'll do it. Check it off the list because I'm really tired of trying to figure things out. You know, I can totally relate to the disciples. Jesus was born, he lived, he taught, crushingly he died, but then he came back and taught some more, and then he leaves again. Jesus was supposed to rescue them like a superhero with a cape, and then he leaves. It's kind of rotten, right? Go ahead, Jesus, ascend to heaven without me. That's mean. So I started looking back at our lessons from the last few weeks to see if I could figure this out. I know Jesus wasn't really mean, so there must be a clue somewhere. And aha, uh -huh, I think I figured it out. Jesus was a teacher. And I know what it's like to be a teacher. It's not easy. I have to show you how to do something over and over and over again. And I try to show you in a different way and then I tell you in a different way and you still forget. Have you ever tried to teach someone how to do something new? I know you all have. And you've probably thought a lot about teachers lately because you're not in the classroom right now. And as much as you appreciate staying in your jammies all day, you also get to see what it means to be a good teacher. A good teacher gives you time to practice and even lets you fail. When I taught my daughter how to ride her bike, I had to let her fall a couple of times. True story, she even crashed into the back of the car. And oh, my heart, it broke when she cried. But I had to let her learn. I couldn't do it for her. And when she finally made it, we both felt so, so good. I guess that's how God feels each time we make progress and pick ourselves up and listen to the love that's inside of us. Maybe Jesus wasn't mean. Maybe he was a good teacher and knew that we have what it takes to grow and learn and make a positive difference in the world. Maybe he knew that with God's love, we can all be superhero teachers. We can certainly try. Let's put on our capes. And as soon as we get back together again, give each other some superhero hugs grow and learn and love. I miss you all so much. This morning's reading comes from the book of Acts, using the Common English Bible translation. The writer of Acts also wrote the Gospel of Luke, so you'll notice that this book picks up where the Gospel left off, after the resurrection. The disciples are still just struggling to understand what has happened. 
They are gathered together in Jerusalem, where Jesus has told them to wait. Hear these verses from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Theophilus, the first scroll I wrote concerned everything Jesus did and taught from the beginning, right up to the day when he was taken up into heaven. Before he was taken up, working in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus instructed the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about God's kingdom. While they were eating together, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. He said, this is what you heard from me. John baptized with water, but in only a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. As a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus replied, it isn't for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going away and as they were staring toward heaven, Suddenly, two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Good morning. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our guest preacher today. Sarah Birmingham Drummond is the founding dean of Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School. As many of you will recall, two years ago, a former associate pastor at Saugatuck Church, Martin Copenhaver, was our guest preacher. At the time, Martin was president of Andover Newton Theological Seminary while his campus was still located in Newton, Massachusetts. The move of Andover Newton from Massachusetts to New Haven, Connecticut was already very much in process then, and it's now been completed with Andover Newton now being fully embedded in Yale Divinity School. Sarah served as Dean of the Faculty at Andover Newton from 2011 to 2019, and played a very central role along with Martin in bringing about that move. I've had the great pleasure of getting to know and work with Sarah since I went on the board of Andover Newton in late 2017. When Martin announced his retirement in the summer of 2019, the board was enthusiastically unanimous in its decision to name Sarah as his successor. And all of us on the board remain unanimous in our support of Sarah in her current position. Sarah graduated from Yale College with a major in ethics, politics, and economics, Harvard Divinity School with a Master of Divinity, and the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee with a PhD in urban education specializing in administrative leadership. She's an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. Sarah has served Andover Newton in increasingly responsible positions since 2005. In addition to her Andover Newton responsibilities, Sarah has written three books and is, other, and is under contract with Pilgrim Press to write two more this year and next. She's also a commissioner for the Association of Theological Schools and chairs the task force that is redeveloping that accrediting body's standards. She blogs regularly and preaches regularly in partnered settings, such as she is doing with us at Saugatuck today. She, her husband Dan, and their daughter JJ reside in New Haven, near the Hopkins School where Dan is a teacher and JJ a student in the 10th grade. As you will get to see and hear for yourselves in a few moments, Sarah is an outstanding preacher. I would encourage you to join us for the Zoom meeting with her at noon when she will be talking about what is happening at Andover Newton now that it is fully embedded in Yale Divinity School. Sarah, welcome to our virtual Saugatuck Church service. Good morning, my name is Sarah Drummond and I bring you greetings from Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School. Thank you so much, friends at Saugatuck Congregational Church 
for inviting me to be a part of your worship service this morning. I'm the Dean of Andover Newton Seminary, a school that you'll come to know as you continue to work with our students. Your pastor, Allison, is one of our fellows, and our beloved John Canning is a faithful member of our Board of Trustees, so I feel like I know you already. Of course, I don't know you, and I'm sad that I'm not able to be with you in person, but I'm also really glad that we didn't cancel my visit because I feel like if I have to cancel one more thing to which I was really looking forward, I'm going to start getting genuinely depressed during this stay-at-home order time. So many things to which I was looking forward this spring, including Andover Newton at Yale Divinity School's graduation, have been pushed and pushed and pushed into the future, and I'm glad that today we can be together. It is a balm, and again, thank you for this kind invitation. I was pleased to see that your church is re-entering the world of the, uh, of the lectionary that you're using, the narrative lectionary, at a point in time where we see a really important event in the Christian year that is just coming up in a couple of weeks. And that is the event we call Ascension Day. So in the first chapter of the book of Acts, we see Jesus ascend into heaven. He is raised from the dead by God. He spends time with his friends uh, coming to appear before them in visions and having really important conversations with them. He comes and he goes during this period of about 40 days, which is an important uh, period of time, as you know. And then at the end of that time, he ascends into heaven. When I think about my relationship with Ascension Day, I can see it in three different phases. Now, taking a step back, the French intellectual um, historian and philosopher, uh, Paul Ricoeur, uses an expression, the second naivete. You might have heard it before. So here's what he means. Here's what Ricoeur means by second naivete. All of us, when we're children, have capacity for wonder. And then as we get older, we become more and more rational. But then as we mature even further, we come back around to wonder in what Ricoeur calls the second naivete, the first one being the naivete of our childhood when we just don't know very much that would make us feel particularly cynical. So my first naivete with Ascension Day, I remember really well, I think I might have been six or seven years old, and I understood the concept of Easter. In fact, I'd had no difficulty believing it at all. And I asked my mother, how did Jesus end up going to heaven if after he died, he came back? And so my mother explained that Jesus elevated up to the heavens after the resurrection. And so I figured that he went there, built heaven on clouds, and that that's where I would go someday after I died as well. Over the course of time, I became more, not so much cynical about the idea of heaven being up there, but I fell a little bit deeper. I was maybe more deep and I no longer understood being God, God being up there or heaven being up there, but I had this sort of quantum mechanics of ascension Namely, that heaven is all around us and that when people die, they're still very much present with us, but in the form of energy or some other metaphysical presence that was beyond our ken, but very real and imminent, meaning everywhere. I feel like there's something about this season, this season of COVID-19, that's taking me into a second naivete that is having me think about ascension and the idea of heaven being up there that I'm just beginning to reclaim and privileged to have a chance to think about it aloud with you. My favorite Psalm is the 121st Psalm and it begins like this. I to the hills lift my eyes from whence will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So depending on what version of Bible you have on your computer or in your home, you might open it to Psalm 121 and see that the Psalm has a title. Now the title 
is called a superscription. The superscriptions in the Psalms were added far after the Psalms were originally sung and then brought together into the first ever Christian hymnal. And the superscription for the 121st Psalm is Song of Ascents. Ascents, not like as in a sixth sense, but rather as in to ascend, A-S-C-E-N-D, to go up. Now, a song of ascents was basically a fight song for pilgrims who were making their way into mountainous pilgrimage um, destinations, singing in order to motivate themselves to keep on going. Pilgrimages were really tough in biblical times. There were no hiking boots. There were no hiking trails. It was too hot during the day. It was too cold at night. And pilgrims had to be motivated to go on their pilgrimage, especially if the pilgrimage required a climb. In this particular song of ascents, we begin with, I to the hills will lift my eyes. From whence will my help come? We do, I think, in times that are difficult, have a need to look up. To look up, literally, to mountains that remind us that really everything we're going through is relatively small and thus more manageable. We also have the need to go up high, metaphorically, in order to be reminded to take time to find perspective. Now, Ron Heifetz, who's one of my favorite writers about leadership, likes to use the metaphor of the balcony. He says that when you're a leader and you're going through a tough time, it's important sometimes to go up on the metaphorical balcony and look around at the dance floor and see what's going on on the dance floor from a perspective, a perspective that is up. So, Ascension Day in many parts of the Christian tradition is a really important day of celebration. In fact, it's a day when we often celebrate baptisms. My husband Dan and I had um, scheduled the baptism of our daughter for Ascension Day because I, when I was a student minister, served a church that took Ascension Day very, very seriously. There's something about baptism that elevates us. There's something about communion, the other sacrament we celebrate, that elevates us. There are ways in which elevation is just as important as the ever presence, the imminence of God. We need our imminent God. We also need transcendence and we need transcendence, especially now. We feel like we've been in a stay at home order forever, but we haven't been. It's really been a relatively short time. We feel like this is never going to be over. It will. It will be over. It's worth it to keep ourselves and to keep each other safe because in the grand scheme of things, which we can only really see when we have perspective, the things that we have to do to stay safe now are not that costly. My sister sent me a meme early in our lockdown that said, our grandparents were asked to go to Europe and fight a war for our freedom. We're being asked to sit on the couch, suck it up. I laughed and I thought myself so above it, but I have to say I've had my moments where I felt like I'm making a huge sacrifice right now, cutting myself off from people I care about. And as I said earlier, canceling a lot of things I really wanted to do. So as you meditate, on Christ ascending into heaven. You could think about it in terms of a first naivete. Isn't it amazing that God loved us so much that God not only sent us a messenger to tell us how to live, but then brought that messenger back to us to show us the awesome might of God. And then God drew that son back into himself. Pretty incredible. Pretty basic, much like even using the pronoun him for God. It's way too literal to capture the entirety of this incredible, awesome message. That's what we find in our more mature faith. 
And that God isn't just up there. God isn't just a him. God isn't so straightforward that we can think about God's might in terms of down and up or big and small, um, sunny or cloudy, but rather God is beyond what we can express. But then we might find our way to that all important second naivete where we say, hmm, there's something about this ascension that's more than a metaphor for me right now. I need to lift my eyes to the hills. That's from whence my help will come. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And amen. Beloved in Christ, to pray is to enter into the wonder and the mystery of our relationship with the Holy One. It is to lift our hearts to God as God leans into us. And so this morning, I invite you to join me in a prayerful space. We'll begin with a few moments of silence. I will offer some words of prayer and then when I say, listen, Holy One, for your people are praying, I invite you to join me by naming out loud people, places, circumstances that are on your hearts and minds today. You might write them down in a journal or on a piece of paper. You might share them with somebody who is sitting in worship with you, or you might just hold those prayers in your hearts and together we will lift them up to a listening God. Come, let us go before the throne of grace. Holy One, we lift our eyes to you, source of strength, source of comfort, source of tenderness and courage. Lift our hearts this day. In the face of loneliness and grief, in the wake of loss and disappointment, in the midst of distress or despair, lift our hearts, we pray. Lift our spirits this day with signs and with wonders. Draw our eye to all the evidence of new life pushing up through the dark soil of our lives like so many greening buds. Holy One, lift our spirits this day. Lift our eyes this day to recognize the ways and places that we have held one another down where we have overlooked human suffering, prevented human flourishing, or trampled on your earth. Holy One, forgive us, we pray, and lift our eyes this day. God of the mountaintop and of the valley, as we lift our hearts to you, we trust that you lean into us. Attend to us, your people, we pray. Listen, Holy One, for your people are praying. Holy One, with gratitude, deep gratitude, we lift these and all our prayers to your listening ears, trusting that you receive them as you receive all of us with your wide open arms. 
We ask these and all our prayers in the name of the risen Christ. Let the people say, Amen. Amen. People of God, welcome to Christ's table. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You who come to me shall not hunger. You who believe in me shall never thirst. And so in company with all who hunger, in body and in spirit, we come to this table and to all our tables to know the risen Christ in this life-giving bread and cup. This communion is open to all who wish to know the love of God through our host and our brother, Jesus Christ. Friends, these are God's gifts for God's people. Come, let us gather around the table. Will you pray with me? We give thanks God of majesty and mercy, for bringing forth the creation and raising us from the dust of the earth by the breath of your being. 
We bless you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for the vision of a day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table. We come in remembrance and in celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to change everything. He taught us how to pray with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Maybe you've heard the story before. Maybe this is your very first time. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was seated at the dinner table with his friends and followers. And at some point during the evening, he took bread from the table and breaking it and giving thanks, he blessed it. And he passed it around saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. As often as you eat this, do so and remember me. In the same way, after the meal, Jesus took the cup and giving thanks for it, blessing it, he passed it around and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for all for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do so and remember me. So friends, we gather at this table with ordinary bread and cup made extraordinary by the presence of the risen Christ among us. And as we share this meal, each in our own place, each at our own table, we are reminded of the profound promise that we are all one body in Christ. I invite you wherever you are to extend your blessing hands over bread and cup or to hold them out like this if you are in a place or space where you do not have an actual bread and cup to share. To join me either way as we ask this prayer of blessing. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread, this cup, all our bread, all our cups, and everyone gathered around, that we may be renewed at these tables and prepared to be your body in the world. We ask it in your holy name. Amen. Beloved, here's what will happen next. In just a moment, I will invite you to share bread and cup with me and with one another. If you are in a room where you have somebody else with you, I invite you to take the bread, to offer it to each other. You can break off a piece and the one who offers the bread might say, this is God's body given for you. And then in the same way, you might take the cup and either drink from the cup or dip your bread and say to yourself or to one another, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you. You might also say this is the cup of blessing. And if you are not yet certain whether this table is truly wide open, if you are unconvinced that you are welcome at Christ's table, friends, then remember this. On the night of which we speak, gathered at table with Jesus, there was one who would betray him. 
one who would deny him, and many who would abandon him before the end. Jesus knew this, and he welcomed them all. So too are we welcome at this table, whoever we are, wherever we are on the journey of faith. We need not have it all sorted out. All you need to be is hungry. Come, these are God's gifts for God's people. Let us share in a holy feast. This is the bread of life. This is the cup of blessing. If you've chosen a slice of bread or a homemade muffin or a bagel, you are encouraged to eat the whole thing. Don't be shy because this feast, it is an abundant feast. And then friends, will you join your hearts with mine in prayer? Christ in our hearts and in our midst, for this moment, this meal, this gathering, we give you thanks. Now, send us out to live as changed people because we have been touched by the living God and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, expect much from us, enable much by us and encourage many through us. So may we feed one another as you have fed us. Let the people say, Amen. Now hear these words of blessing as you make your way out into the world this week, even if that world is in the confines of your home. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of God Almighty, who created you, redeemed you, and will forever sustain you, be with you now and remain with you all forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.